Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Tajik Dajanas, our endeavor to empower Tajik. We believe that sharing this knowledge is the key of enhancing our performances and for our growth as professionals. With this principle in mind, Tajik has initiated a series of webinars conducted by industry experts to give a quick insight of various domains. The topic for today's webinar is five practical tips to save web applications from performance problems. We are delighted to have Ms. Geeta Adinarayan, Performance Architect at IBM India Limited, as our guest speaker. Geeta is a certified IT specialist and a performance specialist from IBM Vexier Lab Services, India Software Learn. She has over 13 years of IT experience. Her day job includes solving performance critical situations, incorporating performance engineering into large complex projects, reviewing solutions for performance, and so on. Geeta has worked with large enterprise customers such as Bharti, Vodafone, HDFC Bank, and so on. Gentlemen, this presentation will continue for the next 45 minutes and we will take your questions after the presentation. In the meanwhile, you can post your queries through the chat pane available in the webinar software. Without further ado, I introduce you to our guest speaker, Ms. Geeta. Yeah, Ms. Geeta, uh, we can see your screen. Yeah, uh, we can see your PPT now. Please start the presentation. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much, Kishan. Uh, team, uh, good afternoon and thank you very much for attending this webinar. What we will do for next 40-45 minutes is to quickly take you through what performance means for web applications. Then we will also go deeper on the five tips that we are seeing on the slide now. I'll also quickly touch upon the channels and services available to go deeper on any of these five topics and beyond. So let's get started. Performance of web applications. Now what does come to your mind when you think of this term? The term which is performance of web application. Most of us use technology in a day-to-day -day life and this has become part and parcel of it. Right? For example, whether to go book a train ticket, whether to pay bill, whether to even download a form for your kids' admission, or whether to go and you know record your work hours, or even, for example, you know tracking your expenses, etc. We do internet, we do use internet, we do use the based applications. Now, again, when we visualize what does performance of these applications mean to us. Now most of us would have had experience, it could be good or bad. Good means you go to a web application, you click on a button, it responds as if you're talking to a friend. You complete your job, happy, happy, you come back. That's that's a very good experience. You're going to go and use that application once more and many more. You are an happy customer. Now let's visualize a scenario where you entered all your information into a form, you're clicking on a button, it either shows the progress bar for a long time or at times you just get page not on exception. The initial reaction itself is not good, right? You feel, oh my God, I have to enter all these details again. 
So it leads, they probably will do it again depending on the type of operation that you are doing. And then twice or thrice you get frustrated. You probably will think twice before going and using that application again. What is all leading to? It is all leading to unhappy customers. It is all leading to loss of revenue for an organization. And it's very difficult to attract this customer to your web application again compared to someone coming newly. But even if more new user comes in, they're going to have the similar experience and they're going to leave. Now, why does it take longer? Why does you, when you click a button, why you don't get the response? When do you need to care about it? When do you need to think about it? Many times it happens that the solution is built, it's deployed, users are using, they are complaining, and then organization gets into doing what is called as postmortems. These postmortems are expensive, and this needs to be done in a very stressful manner because it's a problem to solve. It's not in a solution to be built in future. You have a problem, it needs to be solved. Also, it's not surprising, depending on the criticality of the application, a war room can be opened. It may work 24 by 7 until the solution is found and the problem is fixed. Now, why, why is that we are caring about performance now? Why is it more relevant now? Let's look at some of these statistics. It took 30 years for radio to penetrate up to 50 million customers. It took only 15 years for TV to do the same. And let's look at Facebook. It only took two years. What is all this data telling to us? All these are saying that gone are the days when the development team could say, let's first get the functionality out. Let it work first. Depending on the number of people, we will see whether we need to improve anything with respect to performance. Gone are those days. We are in the era where if we are developing the solution, we need to care for both functionality and also performance because if either one of them fail, it's a failure for the solution. It's a failure, it's an impact on brand image, it's a loss to revenue. More importantly, it leads to unhappy customers. So all of these are coming to a point where performance of the web applications are critical. So, so what, right? So what do we do about it? And what is that we need to keep in mind when it comes to performance of these applications? What are three major things that we need to keep in mind? that we call as performance targets. The first one is end user response time. That is, when somebody clicks on a button or when somebody enters a URL, how long does it take to get the response? Visualize this. Let's say you're talking to a friend, you're talking to a new person. You ask a question, how long does it take for a person to respond? At times you get it quickly, at times the person thinks and responds, at times you may not get the response at all. So the time taken is the critical one. The second one is throughput. How much can you get done within a specified time period? For example, how many bills can be generated in an hour? How, how many reports can be generated in an hour? How many cookies or cookie cutters can cut in an hour? How many pizzas can be made in an hour? Okay. So amount of work done within a time period is what is called as throughput. Now what is the third major one? The third major one is volumetric. The volumetric is the one which provides context to the two parameters or the targets that we talked about, which is response time and throughput. So when we say a response time of three seconds, just we click a button, it should take only three seconds for it to come back with the response. What is the context at which this is relevant? Is only one person using the system, or is hundreds of people using the system, or millions of people using the system? Right? How many simultaneous users are using the system at the same time? Now, one could be logged in. Right? Many people go log into their online banking system. Now, that does not mean that all of these users are clicking the button at the same time. So another important aspect, aspect that we need to care about is simultaneous request. That is, given that the users have logged in, how many requests come at the same time? Another very important question. Are these numbers same? Are these numbers same throughout the day, 
throughout the month, not the year. Most probably no. It does vary. It does vary by seasons. It does vary by day of the month, day of the week, hour of the day, etc. For example, if you're doing a, if it's a shopping website, you'll probably see more load during the Wali time frame. If it's a website by selling gold coins, it will see more traffic during Akshaya Tukia. So there are going to be peaks. There are going to be peaks when this application will see more traffic. And also in terms of growth, will the number of users remain constant? No. More and more users are going to come in and use the system. And what is the expected growth in the next couple of years? It could be three years, one year, whatever is relevant to business. To summarize, when we talk, talk about performance targets, performance of web applications, we need to remember key, three key things. One is what is the expected response time to keep the end users happy? What is the throughput requirement for this application? And under what context, under what volumetric this is relevant? Now let's say yes, we started a project we got to know the use cases. We said this is the response time, this is the volume metric. These are the number of users who are going to use the system. And the project started. And as we can visualize, a project is not going to be delivered by this one person, one team. It's going to be a set of people working together to deliver this. It could be a business analyst. It could be an IT architect. It could be a set of specialists working towards and making this happen. Now, does this performance target mean the same to everybody? At a larger umbrella, yes. Response time remains response time throughput and volume metrics remains same. But the context or the granularity at which they look at it will keep changing. For example, if an end user is looking at the response time, as I was mentioning, what it means is I click on a button and how long it takes to get the response. But what does same response time mean to a person who is developing a piece of code? For them, the response time is how much does this particular method take or how much does this particular module take? Now, how do we bridge or how do we connect, create a bridge between the end user response time and the time that the developer should care for? And how to do it? Most often we see developers saying, my code will just take one second or two seconds. But it is not com uncommon to see 10 components stitched together to provide a new case to end user. So that one. Three seconds. So all these are again boiling down to a point. It's important to define targets. It's important to know what it means to people working in different phases of life cycle. Now let's look at how to achieve it. Understanding that it is important. More often, only way to do this is to have the discipline of having performance engineering incorporated and adopted into the life cycle throughout. Now it's not surprising to see when we go and ask, what are you doing with respect to performance engineering? Most often we will be shown performance test plan. And most often being introduced at the end of the life cycle, just before it goes live. It's almost like going into post-mortem state. Only difference is that you know you are probably doing the post-mortem before deploying it or you know making it available to end users. Now so what is the key? End-to-end -end performance engineering is the key to meet performance targets. That does not mean we choose 100% of the use cases and do this rigorous exercise of performance engineering for all. Usually we use 80-20 rule or 30-70 rule. Choose the ones that are business critical. Choose the ones that are voluminous and spend energy on them. Usually performance engineering activity is a trade-off between how much cost we need to spend versus the risk of that particular use case not meeting performance target. So let's take a look at how does this end-to-end -end performance engineering lifecycle look like, starting from proposing the solution till the time we deploy. 
you would see number of boxes which talks about what all needs to be done. Again, as I was mentioning, the key is when we do it, what we do it, to what extent we do it. The right time, right task, and right depth are the key. And choosing the right use cases are also key. So when we talk about these five tips, we will touch more into the three phases of the life cycle, which is detailed requirement analysis, high-level design, and low-level design. The benefit of looking at these three life cycle phases are that you can catch problems early. You can avoid the post-mortem stage. So, so far we have seen what performance means to web application. And we have also realized that having a disciplined performance engineering approach is the way to achieve performance targets, starting from defining it, working towards achieving it. Now let's go a little more deeper on the five tips. And let's start with the path length first. So what is path length? What is path length with respect to web application? Let's visualize there is a road. There's nobody else on the road, no vehicles. You are the only one traveling on that road. And you want to go from, let's say, Madiwala to Electronic City or some other place from point A to point B in a city. With no traffic, no other vehicles on the road, you're going to take X amount of time to travel from point A to point B. That's path length. Now even if road is free, not all vehicles, not all drivers are going to reach point from point A to point B at the same time. The time is going to vary. What is going to depend on? It is going to depend on the type of vehicle, it's going to depend on who is driving it, and factors, and how good the road is, etc. Similarly, when it comes to web applications, the path length means how long does it take for a transaction for only one user to complete it. So there's nobody else except one user who is using the system and how long does it take. Now one may ask a question. It's not practical that every web application will see only one user. Why are we talking about it? Why is it important? Why is it important? Because the time that you get with one user traveling on the road, with nobody else on the road, is the best time that you get for that particular use case. Because there are no resource contentions, no traffic jam, even if there's a toll gate, you're going to take the ticket and keep moving. You cannot get any time better than this particular time. So if we look at the performance target. Let's correlate to what we talked with respect to response time. So if you're looking at response time of three seconds and you do a measurement for single user, you do the path length measurement, and if you say that it took four seconds, you very well know at no time you're going to meet the response time target until you fix this particular problem. And this can be done very early on in the life cycle. And what is this path length compares of? this comprise of time taken by all these subcomponents in the use case and all the products that are involved in particular solution. So it could move from edge server to web server to app server to db2 and it could move from multiple components within the app server as well. So everything contributes to the path length. Again, if you correlate back, every developer saying that my code just takes two seconds, you can also figure out if that is the symptom that you are seeing by measuring the path length. Again, the beauty of it is every developer can measure the path length and if they are given the budget, they can ensure that whether their code meets the performance target or not right at the development time. So what are some of the ways to find the path length? There are various ways depending on which phase of the life cycle you are at. And some of the commonly used Techniques are, one can use the log messages, depending on whether the log messages are available or not, but this is one of the very common ways to find the path length. One could also use tools such as, uh, profiling tools such as Firebug and Health Center, etc. I'll go through some of them in future slides. And one thing that is important is, the path length is not only meant 
for the end user. As I was mentioning, this is something that's relevant to everybody who is developing any piece of code. So now let's look at how the log messages can be used. So what you see in the snippet of the log is a particular code which had debug statements which talks about what was called and how much time each of the steps took. And this helps very much during the development phase because you don't have to use any other tool to find it. And you can easily find out with one or two execution how much time it takes. Now one thing that the developer should not forget is the path length may not be same. It, do, it does vary. What does it vary? Based, what is it based on? It's based on the depth of your for loops. It, it's based on the type of search algorithms you use, depending on the amount of data that you need to search, etc. So do, it's suggested that you do test the path length with various options so you know the min and max of the path length versus just going with one number. And it may not be the same number again. And another important thing is logs does help, but it can also create nightmares. We will see this at the, at the one of the tips. Now, too much of logging, all of us would know that it, is, it means more I.O., more writing to disk. Writing to disk is more expensive than doing CPU-based operation. So it's good to make this logging conditional. That is, only when we need it, we can turn it on. Otherwise, this is not needed. And definitely not suggested in production environment unless there is a problem and debugging is required. So let's move to the second example where we can know the path length with respect to an end user. So we have used tools such as Firebug and number of engagements. So what does it provide? It provides a view to end user response time. So it tells you once you click on a button, how long does it take for you to get the response? And again, the good part here is you do get the breakdown with respect to which request took how long. You also get the details of what was the size of response. And it helps you to find out out of so many requests, which is the request that you need to focus on. Right? So at times, loading of images takes longer time. At times, it's actually the connection time that takes longer time. At times, it is the server code itself that takes longer time. So from an end user perspective, Fireback can help you to find the path length. And also it can also help you to narrow down to the piece of code or the request where you need to go deeper to find out what is happening. Now the third tool, which is IBM Health Center. IBM Health Center has a number of features with respect to profiling. So what is profiling? So profiling is a technique again related to dynamic analysis of the code. That means you have an external person go and hook on to the running JVM and get the information when a particular use case is executing in order to understand number of details about it. The details could be how much a method took, what is the average time a method took, how many times a method was executed, etc. So as you would see in the screenshot, you can find out which method took how long and how many times it was executed, etc. Now again, where does it help? Uh, it helps in a place where you are doing a system verification test. You have put the codes of multiple people together. You are doing a unit test. You know the path length. Let's say path length was 5 seconds versus the target time of 3 seconds. You want to know where that 5 seconds is going. Which code do you need to narrow down and look into? And profiler does help there because it gives you a clear idea of which method takes longer or a breakup of this five seconds with respect to execution time. So to summarize, Pathlin talked about what if only one person is using the system with no other constraints on the resource utilization and how Pathlin can help to find out problems early in the life cycle which in turn can help you to avoid major grid sets and save web application from performance problems. So let's look into concurrency as the next one. So what does concurrency mean? So in the previous case, we discussed of a scenario where there's only one person traveling in the road. Now as 
I was mentioning that's not the practical case. Road is not really meant for just one person to travel. There are going to be multiple people traveling on the road, and in fact, there are going to be multiple lanes. Depending on the road, there could be multiple lanes, single lanes, etc. And as I was telling you, it's important because no application is going to be used by just one person. And most of the hardware, operating system, middleware applications are built to support concurrency. Now, what does this mean to the developer? Again, I was writing a piece of code. Thinking parallelism is very important when it comes to writing code. Now, why is it important? It is important because every piece of code either goes and alters some data, updates some data, either within the data structure in memory or in the databases. Now, if this parallelism is not considered, there is always a notion that we can do anything and everything with data. But when parallelism comes into picture, one thinks of what if other person tries to access the same data? Do I need to lock it? If I lock it, what is the impact of the other people using it? Right? It's same as we have multiple lanes, we have multiple vehicles traveling on the road. But what is its impact when it comes to a traffic jam? What is its impact when you find a tunnel? Or what is its impact when you find a toll booth? Right? If you really see the speed or the time that you're going to take to reach from point A to point B depends not only on the speed of the vehicle and the driver, but it also depends on the speed and driver and the other conditions of other vehicles also. So thinking concurrency during design phase is very important. And if, it, if it's not done, it could lead to a position. Again, to take an example, a designer could think, I'm going to take files one by one and process it. Versus, I'm going to fetch multiple files together and process them parallelly. Now, even if you think of concurrency, even if you think of multiple people traveling on multi-lane traffic, one thing that needs to be considered is it's not the same number of lanes throughout. You're not going to be on a highway with four roads from point A to point B. We may have to take an exit. We may have to pass to the tunnel or we may have to stop at a toll gate or we, we may even go to a single lane road. So the, similarly in the web-based application also a transaction can go through different level of parallelism at different component level. Now it's very important to remember that when all these transactions can go through parallelly, it's not going to be at the same level of parallelism throughout. And therefore, we need, we need to take into account that what is the speed at which you can travel and consider all this when it comes to response time. And what will help us to visualize this? Typically, drawing call flows can help us visualize what are the different milestones of the transaction, which are the places where we can hit, hit these tunnels or traffic jams, and what can be done about it. If not done, what would happen is it could go to a virtual level as if you know every vehicle is moving one after the other, which is equal to sequential first. So so far we looked at path length, we looked at why thinking parallelism is important versus just a single threaded or sequential thinking is not required or it's not good for designing applications. Now let's look at what is the impact to database connections or what are the best practices or anti-patterns when it comes to database connections. Now what are database connections? As you would have seen in most of the applications, many of these applications work on some or the other information or data. So data manipulation is one of the key workload characteristics. So in order to go and access any of the data in the database, what does uh, application do? Application first needs to establish connection to the database. And once it establishes connection, it can do some operation on it and then release the connection. Now with application service in picture, we try to make efficient use of connection. That means we don't go to database and say every time, let me connect to you, because that's a time consuming thing. The application server can manage a pool of connections. 
and application goes and asks the application server, hey boss, give me one connection, I'm going to use it and release it back to you. And the good way of using this connection is an application goes, says get a connection, use it and release it. And that's so in a manner that it, it doesn't really hold it for a long time. I'll come to the implications of using it for a long time in future slides. But to remember is, it's important for application to get it, use it, and then release it. Now, why are we focusing so much on connection when it comes to performance? Now, the amount of time that you're going to spend in getting the connection and using it and releasing it has an impact on path length. And more so when concurrent users are using the system. Because all the web container threads or all your transactions are going to come and ask for connection. If it's not used effectively, it's almost like waiting in the jam for your turn to come to go. That means the response time is going to increase. Now what are some of the ways available to check the connection usage during development? Now one of the easiest ways is to set the min and max number of connections on the data source to 1. Then the transaction that you are developing, see if the transaction goes through. If the transaction succeeds, that means an application is able to get a connection and it uses it. But there is no guarantee that it is releasing it. But there is a guarantee that it used only one connection. That you are sure about. Now what if, so you run the same transaction again. If there is a leak, your application won't be able to get a connection and you will get an exception which is connection timeout exception. So you are sure that there is a leak using simple tests versus allowing it to happen and going into production using any of the tracing to find out if there are leaks, etc. Now we also have an option in Subsphere application server, the option for JDBC connection tracing, using which you can know even in the concurrent situations what is the state of each connection, whether it's being used, whether it is free or it is, you know, somebody has taken it but not doing any work on it. There's also one more WebSphere administrative command, which is called a show, show pool content. Gives very similar detail to what you see in tracing. It dumps in the details of all the connections in the pool and it also provides the details of the state of these connections. So these three together, if you used, one can find out if there are leaks, if there are any incorrect usage of connections during development time itself versus this becoming encrypted later on. Now let's assume you are looking for a system in production and you do have some doubts about connection usage. What could be the quick indicators to tell you whether the connection usage is fine or not? One could rely on the PMI feature provided by WebSphere application server. PMI stands for performance monitoring infrastructure. So the PMI infrastructure gives you counters such as database connection allocate count. It also gives counters such as database connection release counts. So using the difference of these two, one can find out if there are any leaks. If there are more allocates than releases, it's an indication of leak. The second important pattern that one can look at is see the difference or the ratio between active web container threads and active database connections. If you see that the web container threads are more compared to the active database connections, we are in an okay state. But if you see that the number of database connections are much higher than the number of web container threads, it's a clear indication that one thread is using more than one connection, which means they're either taking the connection, not releasing it, or they do what is called as get, get, use, use, and release only pattern. That means they actually use two connections versus two or more connections versus just one connection, which, which may not give the desired result. So to summarize this slide, even if you're in production, you can use quick indicators such as this PMI counters, to get to have an understanding of these connections being used fine. Or even in case of problems, these can be used to debug and find out is it because of connection usage. Now let's say 
a min and max is defined on the data source. That means only so many connections can be obtained to that particular database. Now what if someone or some thread requests for more connections? What happens? As per the JDBC specification, the connection will be timed out. That means a thread requesting for a connection will wait for a time specified by the connection timeout parameter. And even after that it does not get, it will get an exception from the container saying that connection timeout, which means the application should in turn go back to the user and say please come and try again. Now what are the implications of the connection timeout and how is it usually set? One of the very traditional way of setting connection timeouts is to base it purely on the response time target. So if the response time target for a use case is 3 seconds, one would say connection timeout should be less than 3 seconds. That means you shouldn't spend all time waiting for timeout itself, waiting for getting connection from database itself. But is that all? Now let's look at a scenario. You have 200 web container threads, but you have defined, you have two data sources going to two different databases and you have de defined 200 as the max connections in both. If there is a problem in one database, all the 200 web container threads can be consumed because all of them are going to go and wait for connection, which means even the other database which is working, you cannot access it. It's because the road is full. Road is full because one side road is blocked. Even if the other side road is open, you can't move it because all vehicles came in and just took them without allowing the other vehicles to pass to the other side road. So what is a better way of looking at connection timeouts? Better way of looking at connection timeout is to take a look at the request rate, look at the response time targets, and also look at the incoming rate of the request. Use all these three to effectively tell what should be the correct connection timeouts. One is to ensure that the user does not click on a button and keep waiting. The second one is to ensure that blockage on one side road does not prevent vehicles moving to a side road which is working. And last, very important point, do not forget to handle connection timeout in application, which means some applications do have timeouts at the application level. When connection timeouts happen, that timeout should be invalidated. That means you don't have to wait for, let's say, 3 seconds, 10 seconds expecting response because you know that you can't even go to the database. So go back and give the error message back to the user without waiting for that amount of time. Okay, let's move and look at how logging could create problems. So initially when we talked about path length, we did talk about logging helping in finding the path length. Many people do use Log4j as the framework for logging. And many places it's the only aid for problem determination. But one thing, very important thing to remember is every log being written is an I.O. to disk. And disk I.O. is usually slower than the CPU processing or writing to memory. Now some of the things are the experiences that we have seen is every component trying to write to the same log file. And as you increase concurrency, as you increase number of concurrent users, even during performance tests, you would see that the response time is coming down. And if you take a thread dump and see, we would notice that all the threads are going and waiting on writing to the same file. And what is that they are writing? They are writing logs. And what what, what can be done about it? Agreeing that logs are important, one way out for this is to write to different logs. So all components don't come and you know wait in the same queue. They go to different log files. And more importantly, to ensure that these logs are not going to the same disk. Because even if it's different files going to the same disk, it's going to be the same schedule which is going to rotate and which has to write to the file. And more often, using TAN systems are the best ways for logs to achieve good throughput in terms of I.O. Even in SAN, distribution of disk is going to be the key. End of the day, you don't want to go and rely on the same disk for writing all your log files. We also had a scenario where developers wrote some debug messages 
or there were debug messages that were coming in the log. And when we asked the development team, it was a debug message. So we asked the development team, why is debug messages coming in the production system? It took them almost number of days to go figure out where that logging was being written. The reason is, they said, I'm turning it off in one configuration file, but they had enabled it in another file. So you need to have a good way where you can centralize the configuration of the log files. So you know when you turn on, it's going to work, and when you turn off, it's going to work, versus handling it at different components at the code level itself. Again, the last one, but not the least, to remember is, just using log4j, or even if you ask developers, what are you doing for logging? I'm using log4j. That does not answer questions with respect to are you writing it at right levels? Is it OK for performance? So let's look at what is the impact of the backend system with respect to performance, and why is it important? How do we define a, define a backend system? Usually, these are the systems which are outside application boundary. Usually, it does not run in the same JVM as your application. For example, it could be a self-care application talking to a billing system in the backend. It could be a net banking application talking to the core banking system of the backend. And most of these backend systems may not be just used by the application that you're developing. It could be used by multiple other applications. Now, why do we care about these systems? We care about it because it's part of the path length. The time it takes is, will become a subcomponent of the path length. One more important point is when it goes from one system to another system, you may do conversion of formats. You may do conversions of protocols. It may go to an ESP. So depending on the interface, you actually spend a little more time, a little more resource in making this request happen. And path length does include this, which means the response time is impacted because of this interfacing. Now, what are some of the things that you could think of? Use asynchronous calls where possible. Why, do, why are we saying this? Because you're not going to hold your threats, but there, you also need to be aware of the implications in terms of how are you going to process the response messages. What if the backend system is not available? Because even if it is not, if it is slow, the application can continue to give the request, which is more like beating a person who is dying. So using asynchronous calls can help when designed rightly. And have timeouts for each of the backend systems. So most of the connections, most of the connectors, either with backend systems or database, comes with connection timeouts. Also on the operation timeouts, such as SQL timeouts, web service timeouts, etc., use search to the issue key. Again, just setting connection timeout is not the solution to the problem, but setting the right connection timeout is the key. We've also witnessed situations where one backend system going down or one backend system becoming slow or slow kills the entire application. This is very similar to the analogy that I was giving with respect to one side road is blocked, the entire highway is blocked even if other side roads are open. Not setting maximum connections, not setting the timeouts correctly, correctly can lead to this. So watch out in terms of tuning parameters rightly to know if you will lead to that kind of a situation. Now let's understand what does transaction integrity to do with backend systems and also with respect to performance. This is very relevant because once you start the work, the transaction scope starts. And once you end the work, the transaction scope ends. So anything that happens between these two points is called as in-flight. And the application service needs to know of the steps to either roll back or commit, because even if one step fails, you need to fail the entire transaction, which means it is more work for application server. It's more checks and balances that it needs to do. More so if it's a two-phase commit and transactions managed using global commits. So use it when required. Use the transaction integrity for the steps that is really required. And often the combination of application server as a transaction manager and the reconciliation ways are used to ensure transaction integrity.
So to summarize what did we see so far, we had a quick look at what performance means to web application. We had a mental map of it. We talked to three major performance targets that one need to remember, response time, throughput, and volumetrics. Then we went a little more deeper on the five tips that we called as the ones that are there in this slide. Now, whatever we discussed for the last 45 minutes, though we called it as deeper, it's actually just the surface of some of these really in-depth topics. And once you buy the software from IBM, there are various channels using which you can go deep dive on the topics that we discussed today and also beyond. So I'm going to use next quick five minutes to take you through the services that we provide. And as you see in, in this slide, you will start off when you build the solution, you will, if you're using IBM software, we do provide help in terms of delivering solutions, getting customer delight from your own customers, and helping in the in achieving the delivery timeline. So we do help in delivering the system built on IBM software, specifically the middleware. And if you come to the left left hand side, we also help you in building self sufficiency in terms of health checks, in terms of education and training programs. So you will be able to come to a point where you can tell I need help for these pieces, but I'm self sufficient for these activities. So let's move and look at the type of offerings we have. Uh, as I was mentioning in the last slide, we have what is called as self-sufficiency enablement offerings. I'll talk about COE in next couple of slides. This is more to do with, when, when we talk about self-sufficiency, it's not just going to come by educating and training. We have something more to do with it. I'll talk to it when we go to next slide. We also have exclusive set of offerings called performance engineering services. In fact, whatever you have seen as tips are based on our day-to-day -day experience of either going and doing firefighting in fixing grid sets or reviewing for performance or delivering performance for large volumetric related projects. We also have offerings around the maturity and health check assessments. So we don't have to wait until you see problems. We can come and help in terms of doing regular health checks and to be able to proactively identify tasks that you need to do in order to avoid some of the risks. If you're thinking of migration, we do have offerings to help you go to the latest level of software and use the latest functionalities available with those. So we did, we did talk about the center of excellence offering. Now let's talk a little more about it or what does it give. More often when it comes to business, the priority is running the business and IT has to help business in realizing the dream or the vision that they have. More often many of the business depend on IT companies, but how much that dependency needs to be. Uh, if you need to achieve the right set of balance, you need to have the team which is self-sufficient on certain tasks and you also need to come to a level where you are very clear that you need help on certain aspects. Now when it comes to self-sufficiency, we have the COE program using which we can provide deep education tailored to, tailored to your organization needs. More importantly, we will work with your team with your application and infrastructure so team is aware of how to practice what was taught in the class on their own application. Then we also have mentoring programs, which is a long-term basis. So it's not just like we came, did the training, then uh, we helped with your program, but a long relationship where the attendees can come and ask questions and seek guidance in order to build the self-sufficiency. So coming to performance specifically, using the experience and using the lessons learned from number of crit sets, number of performance related projects. We have put together a enablement offering which is performance monitoring and problem determination training which is a five day lab oriented hands on training using which a person can go in and understand how to do performance monitoring, how to debug problems, what are the tools available, when to use what 
what is the approach that I need to take in case of crystals? So one can get answers to many of them in the five-day workshop that you see. So these are some of the channels that are available in for you to leverage and to go deep dive on the topics we discussed and beyond. I've also listed the references of the tools and also one of the blog series on performance which talks through what different people involved in the life cycle need to worry about when it comes to performance. So we have come to the end of this presentation uh, and uh, we are open to taking any questions now. Uh, the questions are shared with you. Can you can you check them in the question frame? Uh, sure. Just going it from beginning so that we'll try to answer how many ever we have. There's a question which asks, which will be the language for the future web application to work and deploy ever easily? Um, in, in terms of, let's look at what we have now and what the future could look like. So if you look at the current language, it's Java and set of other scripting languages that are dominating the web application landscape. And these are not going to vanish very quickly. These are here to stay for some more time. So if um, my personal opinion would be Java J2E will remain. Along with it, things like Ruby, things like PHP, and those are picking on. So those scripting languages will also come into picture. But again, in terms of deployment, you will still rely on some enterprise class software like the state application server to really deploy these applications. So shall I take the next question? Does it answer the question post? Yeah, please take the next question. Okay. The next question is in future there can be any industry that may run purely on the web arise. So for ease of use there must be a unique deployment environment. So please tell me your idea about this. So today if you see most of the industry, be it telco, be it banking, be it retail, be it government sector, uses web. Web is one of the channels to get many of these services. Now when it comes to deployment, so far, I mean the older trend is, you know, one, one writes the monolithic application, having number of functionalities and then they deploy. And today's need is something that is modular, something that is componentized, something that can be put together and stitched and delivered very quickly in terms of deployment also. So if you really see when the WebSphere application server versions that you are getting, most of the latest versions that support the deployment of ODSI bundles, etc. That means the applications themselves can be componentized can be exposed as web services, etc. So even if some of the industries tries to go purely on web, the deployment is supported by the Enterprise Plus application server. But the key is to have this thinking of the application, having the thinking of services versus the application. So it's not going to be one application having everything deployed on one hardware. It's going to be a set of services realized by one or the other application which can be stitched together to give a business service. Like say, if you really visualize, you have a need for a lot of flexibility and also the nature using which you can stitch them together faster. So even if web is the only channel, all these fundamentals will remain, remain the same. Okay. Let me take the next question. Do you think that the aneroid will perform in web applications? 
Okay, I think this is an answer to another question, but uh, in, in terms of aneroid, the comment that I have is when we talk about the web channel, the other one very emerging channel is the mobile channel for accessing information and for accessing channels. Some of the fundamentals and some of the best practices differ from the normal web applications, the way they are designed, etc. So what is applicable to web may be applicable to the mobile platforms also, but mobile platforms do require a different thinking and aspects that need to be considered when it comes to performance. A simple thing, for example, if a mobile is off and you need to push something, you will need the capability of store and, store and forward in the mobile platform. We also have next question which is, does various devices affect the performance and how this can be optimized? Example, mobile devices. Um, now, what is different when it comes to mobile devices compared to the web channel? What is different is you are not going to get your packet delivered to the browser or a client the way you would get it for your browser. It may have to go through a series of gateways, towers, etc. before it comes to you. So that needs to be considered. The second important thing is what are the kind of format these devices support, etc. So if you're talking about mobile platform, if you're talking about mobile applications, various devices does have a say on performance. It depends on what format, it depends on what kind of connectivity they have. So these are other few other factors that you need to consider for mobile application or performance of mobile application compared to the traditional web application as such. We also have another which is is this IBM profiling freeware or licensed. All the tools that I have put in the reference including IBM Health Center, IBM Support Assistant, Firebug, they are freely available for download and usage. So in fact, if you go look at the IBM Support Assistant, it has number of plugins to help you analyze heat dumps, help you analyze thread dumps, help you monitor web sphere application server using PMI. And it, it has a host of other tools too. Sarah, there's one more question on, is there any other Pathland tools available apart from IBM? And do they cover network latency? So if you look at the tools that we covered, we talked about Firebug, which is freely available, which is not an IBM tool. IBM Health Center definitely exists from IBM. Um, if you look at Firebug, it does give you information about the time it took to connect to network and the network latency to some extent. And in some of the projects, they've also used tool called as Visual VM, which is an which is an openly available tool, which can help, which which can also be used as a profiling tool. There's a question on how to connect pathlane time to concurrency time in the form of percentage degradation. Very good question. As I was telling, uh, path length is the best time that you can get and the time that you would get when multiple users are connecting is usually equal to or greater than what you would see in path length. Now how do you connect these two dots? One of the best ways to do it is to do performance tests. You measure the path length using one user, then you increase the number of concurrent users to instead. It could be 50, 100. 500,000 depending on what volumetrics you need to support and usually we plot this graph of response time with increasing number of concurrency. So again, it is not that at any level of concurrency the application should meet the response time target. That's why the volumetric that we mentioned as one of the performance target is very critical. So you can say this application is expected to support 2,000 concurrent users. At 2,000 concurrent users the response time is two seconds. With 
10 concurrent users this response time is one second, that's still fine because your curve is within the response time target starting from 10 users up to 2,000 users. And that's what you need to look at. Okay, there's a question which says, can we have something for micro-based, Microsoft-based web applications as well? How we can find issues in case of ASP.NET websites and web applications? Um, I'm, an, uh, I'm not an expert on Microsoft, but one information that we looked in this presentation that can help for Microsoft-based solution also is Firebug. So if you're really caring about the end-user response time, you could use Firebug. One more thing, the techniques that we talked about in terms of logging, etc., those are applicable for any vendor-based application. This is a question on any resources you have that show how to use different log files in a single application using log4j. Uh, one of the best ways that we have seen is to use different log files based on different application server instances, or even better to use different log files just for different modules itself. So if you have if you have different packages in your log in in your application, you could use different log files for those also. Uh, if if you need any snippet of the code or examples, uh, feel free to contact me on TechGeek. On, on the using the profile information and we should be able to help you. So there's a question on how do you separate application server response time, DB response time, and web server response time for performance testing. Now this is usually a challenge for many people doing performance tests because you don't know where most of the time is spent. Now one of the ways that you can do is if you see that one of the use cases is taking longer time, you could do combination of profiling and the PMI data to get this breakdowns. And more importantly, if you're using debug logs, those can help as well. For example, the debug log, debug log should, could say it took so long to do this DB operation. But let me give you an example of where we have done it. So we were analyzing one of the applications uh, which was taking longer time for a use case. We didn't know whether it was application server code that was taking longer time or whether it was DB that was taking longer time. So we did do profiling both on application server and on the database server. And looking at the profiling data, we could find out that it was actually the DB time that was contributing to most of the response time. And we could, another way that can be applied here is to go look at the PMI data that is given by WebSphere application server. You will get the times for individual servlets, and you will have times for the amount of time a database connection was in use. So correlating these two information, one can find out in which part of the entire architecture the time is being spent. The next question is, if a web page requires a database connection for a long time for various functionalities on that page, do you suggest get, use, and release a connection for each functionality or use single connection for all the functionality? Good question again. The, the thinking here is what is the transaction scope for you? Have you enabled auto commit or not? If auto commit is okay for you, use it, get a connection, use it, release the connection immediately. That will work for you. But if everything is in a transaction scope and you want to commit it all together, then you will have to hold that connection until the transaction is complete. Or you will have to explicitly issue a commit from your application. Now, even if you use the transaction scope 
what would be best is to put the SQLs or database operations close to each other so that you don't really keep a connection without using it. This will minimize the impact of other requests coming and trying to get the connection but not really getting it and in fact the existing connections are taken by somebody else but that they are not being in use. The key questions are what kind of transaction scope you need and even if you need transaction integrity keep them together. Keep the various functionalities on database together such that you get use and release the connection. So there's a question on JDBC connection tracing any tools. Uh, we discussed about two options here. One is show pool content uh, was admin command is available to dump the details of the connections telling the state of each. That's one option. The second one is say go and enable JDBC tracing and there is a plugin tool available in IBM support assistant which can help you to go through that, go through the output trace files and tell you if there are possible leaks and any other anti-patterns. There's one quick question which is how does logging help in performance? Now if, if you really see logging as such does not really improve performance in any way. It in fact reduces performance but the places where it helps is debugging performance problems. So again, the right mix of debug logs in places which can help you to debug problems is a good way of using logs. But if you just write logs, that's not going to help in performance in any way. Because we are only going to increase I.O. and that I.O. is going to increase the response time. Considerations at application design level, request to share suggestions, tips and practical cases. Um, since this question is not very specific, my recommendation here would be to um, refer to the seven series blocks whose link that I have included in the end of the PPT. The seven series block does speak through number of best practices when it comes to designing for performance. If you have any questions, uh, do let us know. What would be the best benchmark for justifying pass length? Now, the key word here that I'm taking from this question is justifying. Now, what is path length? Path length, we said the time taken for a transaction to complete. Now, what is the relevance it has? It depends on who is going to use it, what kind of application it is, etc. Now, in terms of benchmarks, there are references or the guidelines that can help you to set the right targets for the path length or even for response times. For example, it's told that if an application provides three seconds response time, it's equal to a person talking to a close friend who can understand them quickly and respond back quickly. If an application is someone who is taking five seconds more, it means you're talking to a person for the first time, they're taking some time to think and come back. So it depends on what kind of application you're building, what kind of interaction or experience you're expecting your end customers to have. So if you can provide that experience of talking to a friend, talking to a close friend, that's going to help in building this customer loyalty and happy customers, you should target for it. But if you think it's a long transaction where success is the key, for example, they have provided their credit card information, etc., clicking on it, they are okay to wait, but it should be successful. In those cases, even telling five, six seconds are okay. So benchmark would vary from application to application, could use these references as rule of thumb.
Now again, one can say that you know we have built the application. The cost length is 10 seconds. It is taking 10 seconds because we are calling 50 components for a use case. Can that be used as justification? Probably no, right? Because the end user who is going to use this use case need not be aware that it uses 50 components internally and therefore it takes 10 seconds. But if you are calling an external party and external backend application and that backend application is taking 9 seconds out of 10 seconds, there's much that an application can do. So when, when you are talking to that backend, you need to highlight this point, give the breakers and tell because of response this backend application, you are not able to meet the response and target set for our application as such. There's one question on how to check how many requests are coming to the servlets on that sphere. A good question. So the PMI or the performance monitoring infrastructure that I talked about has a counter which can tell a number of time a servlet was invoked and also the average response time provided for that servlet. So PMI can certainly help answer this question. There's one question on how to increase the request time or if you know how much time the request will take the process using IHS. Um, I would ask the requester if you could explain this question a bit. I should be able to answer. Right now I'm not able to understand the specific point being queried here. How can I find memory leak in web application? Uh, one of the examples I could use is uh, we have a plugin in IBM Support Assistant. You could take a couple of heat dumps. The heat dumps will provide the state of all the objects or usage of JVM heap or any other part of the memory at any point in time. So taking a couple of heap snapshots Comparing them can provide an information of memory leak. So the tools that comes as part of IBM Support Assistant has the capability to do it. In fact, one of the tools, again, that I've mentioned in the reference slide, which is called as IBM Performance Tuning Toolkit, if you use it, you have an option of just clicking a button to take heat dumps. And if you use those heat dumps in the heap analyzer, you should be able to find out if there are any leaks in the application. And if you go to IBM Developer Works, there are very good articles in terms of what this leaks mean and how to prevent. There's a question on how client-side scripts impact on web application performance. A very good question. These days, there's some number of things that are happening on the client side. For example, AJAX, asynchronous way, asynchronous HTTP request, etc. So traditionally what was one request from client to server is becoming five requests or ten requests from client to server. If you don't achieve similar parallelism at the application server, it's almost like having a parallelism at the front end but the single lane at the back end. So client-side scripts definitely have an impact on performance in terms of what is the kind of parallelism that can be achieved. The second one that we have also noticed specifically with respect to JavaScript, etc. is what is the size of the JavaScript that you are trying to render from server to client. Many times loading this one time takes a longer time. Tools like Firebug can help you find out if loading scripts are taking time.
Which tools are used for monitoring web application from IBM? Uh, there are a number of tools. Specifically on performance, as I was mentioning, we have tools available uh, for free under IBM Support Assistant, which again, there is a specific plugin called IBM Performance Tuning Toolkit, which can be used for monitoring the WebSphere application server. We also have very comprehensive enterprise class monitoring tools under our Tivoli portfolio. So we have tools such as ITM, IBM Tivoli Monitoring, ITCAM, which is the suite of products for monitoring your transaction times, monitoring your various resources, correlating it to say, you know, if one of the application goes down, what is its impact on a use case? So the Tivoli suite of products gives a very strong enterprise level monitoring tools capability. And if you're looking at just a quick problem determination, ISA can help. If you're looking at enterprise class monitoring, then IBM Tivoli tools can help you. And most of the Tivoli tools are agent-based, and even some of the ISA tools are agent-based. There's a question on, for a single user, it takes five seconds. Is there any norm for end user's response time? Um, if a single user takes five seconds, the first question to ask is, what is the performance target for this use case? Is it five or greater than five seconds? If yes, you can go for the concurrent user thinking. And for end users, the question is, Again, compare it with the response time target. If the response time target is 10 seconds, then for end users, you should get response time less than 10 seconds. So the key is to compare both your single user and the concurrent user times with the performance targets and decide on whether you want to improve with respect to one use case, the path length, or whether you need to look at the concurrency issues, such as synchronized block of code or resource contentions, contentions at DB, locking, etc. How important caching in performance tuning? In your five tips, where will it fit? So if you look at caching, what are we saying? In caching, we say that we really don't go to the actual backend system to get that data, but we have an intermediate system where this information can be stored. So the intermediate system could be the JVM on which application is running, or it could be an external distributed cache like Extreme Scale or XC10 appliance where the caching information is stored. Now, what is its impact? It has direct impact on the path length, if you see. What is the impact? You are cutting down the time to go to these backend systems and you are fetching it from the cache. So the path length should reduce. If the path length does not reduce by using cache, then there is a big problem. The second one is also concurrency. Now, why is it important in concurrency? You are hitting backend system lesser because you are not going to the same backend system to read the information, same information again and again. You are fetching it from a faster system or you are fetching it within the same JVM where your application is running. So in the five tips, it would fit very well to path length and concurrency. How to compute timeouts? Can you explain detailed request rate, incoming request rate, etc.? Now, there is not a set formula where we can say timeout is equal to request rate. Uh, it's a function. We know that it's a function of these three. Uh, there is no explicit formula that we have used, but what can be done is to use the tuning exercise, use a couple of iterations of test to arrive at the formula that will work for that particular system. But two major questions that we need to ask is, what is the impact of timeout on the response time? number one. Number two is what is the impact of timeout on the other services that are working fine.
is a question on logging. What is the preferred approach for logging? Using application server log file or having a separate log file stored on some other location? Now in terms of correlating information, we have seen that these being locked to the same file gives you very neat information of what happened both at the infrastructure level and at the middleware level. So you don't have to correlate two different log files to know the information. In fact, we had an engagement where putting these two into the same file really helped to find the root cause of a problem because we could know what was really taking the application to hang state. Now the flip side of it is how much of log is being generated. If the application generates too much of log, you need to take care of whether it's logs are rotating, you have sufficient space, etc. There's a question on is it possible to use same user ID for two data sources? Um, again, I, I am not able to answer this question right now. I will need few more specifics on whether it is the same database, two different databases, what is the authentication mechanism, etc. If provided, we may be able to help on this question. What is the purpose of FFDC logs? FFTC stands for First Failure Data Capture. That means it's an indication that a failure has happened. And this is also a mechanism using which IBM service teams can find out which part of the code, which part of the WebSphere code itself is causing. Uh, for example, if you have connection timeouts, you would get FFTC logs using which the service team can determine what is going wrong. So it's basically an aid to service team to debug and to fix the problem. How do I calculate database connection pool size in WAS? Now it depends on the type of application. It depends on the way connections are used. Now two suggested ways to set the right size of connection pools. One, do performance test. Based on the results of performance test, set the connection pool value in test environment. The second alternative is see if you can use any of the performance advisors that comes along with WAS. And again, whatever is the advisor suggests, what we have seen and definitely works in practicality is to rely on your performance test and use that information or use the information that you have monitored in the production environment to set the right size of connection. There's a question on JVM parameter setting. Is there any guidance on the JVM parameter settings? Example, if my RAM is 16 GB, what is the bare minimal value for XMS and XMX? A very good question. Um, when you run an application server which runs on JVM, you can turn on an option called verbose VC, which means please, we are asking JVM, please write the details of garbage collection into a file. And we have a tool, again, under the umbrella of IBM Support Assistant, which can be used to suggest the right values, not only for XMS, XMX, but for your nursery area, tenure area, it also talk, It also will give you an idea of what was the post times. That was what was the amount of time the garbage collection took. And you can visualize the impact of it on path length on, or on response time. So enable verbose VC and take the outputs, feed it into the tool under IBM Support Assistant and get good graphs and ideas of what should be the type of policy that's good for your application, what should be the XMS, XMX, etc. What are the performance counters that we look for performance fine tuning? Now, the performance monitoring infrastructure or PMI that I talked to gives various numbers of counters. But handful of them are some things that we use in every engagement. For example, 
number of active web containers, number of active database connections, number of times the um, servlet was invoked, right? The JVM max size that it went to. So these are handful of parameters that are helpful. When enabled using PMI can give a very good view of the performance of your application. And in turn can be used to set the right tuning values. Again, one, one point to note is that tuning is not a one-time activity. You need to do multiple iterations of the test. And based on the results, one parameter at a time needs to be changed to get to know what is the optimal set of tuning parameters or values that you can set for your application. Okay. So, looks like we've answered all the questions. Uh, yeah, uh, most of the questions are answered now. So, uh, there are a few questions unanswered. Uh, we can take this question offline. So, Keshav, I actually went till the end of the list, questions list. And I yeah, I have not shared a couple of questions. I have not shared a couple of questions with you uh, because you are running out of time. So, those questions can be taken up okay. and answers can be posted on techgeek.com. Okay, sure. So now we can conclude this uh, session. Okay. So team, thank you very much for taking your time and attending this session. I hope you found it uh, helpful. If you have any further questions or any places where we can help you, uh, do let us know. We'll be glad to do so. Thank you very much. Thanks Ms. Gita for your informative session on high practical tips to save web applications from performance problems. It was indeed an enlightening session. I would also like to thank our participants for the support in making this webinar a huge success. The recording of this webinar will be available on techlist.com by tomorrow. Gentlemen, the next session in this webinar is happening today at 5 p.m. Topic for the webinar is Developing Java Plus for Native Application on Android. We will be having Dr. V. Subramanian, Director of CTO, the National Software Private Limited, as our guest speaker. So see you all at 5 p.m. Thank you.